tempted to try and cram in a lot of information about RSV and flu, but I thought mainly just focusing on RSV would, would be what we should do. Um, and what I'm, what I'm going to talk about are a couple of studies that we've, um, that we've done recently which have challenged some views that I've had um, about RSV. So by way of introduction to this session, um, <clears throat> after all this talk of these severe high mortality um, viruses, which are actually quite rare in terms of, of um, global impact, <clears throat> I thought I'd put up this, this slide. Is the pointer in the middle? In the middle. Okay. <clears throat> so this is from Jay Misgert looking at what actually contributes to <laughs> global burden of disease. And lung infection, um, if you include tuberculosis, I guess, and COPD and asthma, you, know, you could argue that if we could get rid of um, these common lung infections, we could actually smoke with relative impunity without necessarily developing um, COPD. So lung infections are incredibly important as a global um, <coughs> impact on, on disease. So <coughs> two, two viruses to compare and contrast. So we've got influenza, which we're going to hear quite a lot about in this session. Um, I would say that we, the vaccines that we've got are pretty imperfect. There was a recent um, symposium at the Francis Crick Institute in London, and the end of which the conclusion was that we could almost add influenza to the list of pathogens for which we do still don't have um, an optimal vaccine, and that we'd need to um, develop um, much better vaccines for flu because it's so erratic. Some years it doesn't, the flu vaccines really don't work very well. So for RSV, <coughs> we have as yet no vaccine, although it does appear to be um, a soluble problem in that we do have some correlates of protection. We can protect passively with monoclonal antibody with palivizumab. Um, in terms of the immunology of it, I think a very interesting feature is it's relatively poor immunogenicity. The virus um, induces antibodies, so all of us in this room will have antibody to it because we've been repeatedly infected um, throughout our lives. About 96% of us will have been infected by our third birthday. Um, and it's quite easy to reinfect um, people, which I'll talk a bit more about. So if I went around the room and sprayed RSV up your noses, I could get quite a lot of RSV infections despite you having antibody. Um, vaccine enhanced disease is well characterized. I won't talk about that, but we've done a lot of studies on that. <laughs> and I think we sort of understand it, but it's a relatively rare phenomenon. So in terms of <coughs> what um, it causes, it causes an intense inflammatory response. This is a section through a human lung. Um, this was actually a child who was seen in hospital um, <coughs> Uh, but sent home because they didn't have very severe disease and they died in, a, in an accident on the way home and were brought in um, and underwent post-mortem. But you can see around this airway, which should just be full of air, you've got this intense inflammatory infiltrate with an exudate into the airway of inflammatory cells. So it's a very inflammatory virus and a lot of the disease, you could argue, is actually due to the host inflammatory response rather than the virus itself. There's also really, to us um, viral immunologists, there's a lot of interest in what the virus is doing to the host. So RSV appears to have evolved a number of specialist functions in, in a number of its proteins. The non-structural proteins in particular se seem to be specialized in disrupting host immune responses, particularly innate immune responses. And there is some recent evidence that non-structural proteins actually <coughs> evolved from the matrix protein, uh, which is already polyfunctional, but which, uh, which developed additional functions and, and migrated towards the front end of the genome in order to be abundantly expressed very early during, um, during transcription. Um, there's also this very interesting um, homology between the viral surface glycoprotein G, which is very heavily glycosylated, <coughs> Um, which appears <coughs> probably to act as a, a mimic of fractalkine and engage with the, the fractalkine receptor or possibly some other closely similar biological function. And whether that's just in, to enhance its ability to enter into certain cells, um, we're not quite certain. 
but it's a, it's a very interesting virus in terms of its immunology. <coughs> so this is a nice picture which I've taken from one of our recent EU collaborative um, studies. We're <coughs> publishing a series of articles as part of this Rescue EU at the End consortium <coughs> looking at the global incidence, the impact of RSV, particularly in Europe, um, in readiness for the introduction of antivirals and vaccines. And I think this, this graphic just summarizes some of the important things about RSV in terms of the global incidence. So 33 million respiratory tract infections due to RSV per year. Um, mortality. Most of the child mortality is actually confined to developing countries. 99% um, of the childhood deaths are probably in low and middle income countries, according to the estimates. Um, but there are various risk factors that make children much more susceptible to dying from RSV, which is really the, um, the only deaths that we tend to see in well-developed healthcare systems. I don't know whether we include the NHS in that, but in well-developed healthcare systems, um, children really shouldn't die um, unless they have pre-existing factors. In terms of hospitalization, um, it, it causes a, a vast um, burden on healthcare systems. But this is, this is out in the Lancet Infectious Diseases um, just within the past few months, so it's a nice review. This is from that same review, um, which <coughs> breaks down the different attempts to make, make vaccines into different types. We have actually just completed a study of this one, Syngem, which was a first-in-man um, intranasal mucosal vaccine, um, which we have submitted for publication. It hasn't come out yet. Um, development was halted because when the initial results were shown to the investors, they pulled out their investment and the company went into bankruptcy. So I think there is, there is um, <coughs> actually in the follow-up investigation, which I hope will come out soon, um, we can demonstrate rather more immunogenicity than we saw in that initial, um, in, that, in those initial results. But there are a lot of different um, attempts being made to develop a vaccine for RSV. As I say, it does appear to be a tractable problem, and it's one of the last big common viruses for which a vaccine um, looks like it might be feasible. So there are, <coughs> there are many companies trying to develop um, vaccines. Now, this is, from, this is a graphic from a review which we published last year in the Annual Reviews of Immunology, which I think illustrates the range of RSV disease. So, so far, I've been talking about RSV disease as being um, a disease of babies that causes, br causes bronchiolitis and which is associated with bronchiolitic wheeze. Um, the causality of that association is not quite clear, but I, I think probably the evidence in general supports the idea that bronchiolitis may actually be to some degree causal of later childhood wheeze. It also participates in the exacerbation of asthma and COPD and presents in an interesting way in older adults um, producing an insidious delayed illness. So the typical story might be that grandma or granddad is sitting around smoking away in the corner um, with some pre-existing factors. The grandchildren come home at Christmas and by mid-January the cold has really gone to grandma or granddad's chest and by the end of January they're struggling. They're admitted to hospital, they're uh, put on oxygen and they're dead within a few few days thereafter. So that would be a typical sort of presentation for this rather insidious disease um, <coughs> which is associated with peaks in RSV um, circulation but which is often undiagnosed because by the time they come to medical attention the actual cold has been gone and went. Um, I, I've put down here at the bottom some of the immune responses but um, I will um, let you go read that review if you're, if you're interested. So this is something that we published a few years back in the Blue Journal, which was looking for RSV by PCR and sputum samples. So this was coming up from the chest of patients with chronic obstructive lung disease. And here I've divided the patients into three, one in which none of the sputum samples throughout the year were positive for RSV, some where RSV was only detected in the RSV season, and some where we found RSV throughout the year. And in these patients with chronic bronchitis where you have persistent detection, 
of RSV, there's a, an average loss of lung function of, of 200 mils per year, which is quite significant if you can think of that accumulating in patients that might only have, say, 800 mils of, of FEV1 available to them. So <coughs> this, that, that sort of study suggested, uh, where am I, sorry, um <coughs> that there might be some, um, some persistent inflammation which is being caused um, by RSV. So I'd just like to finish this section by, <coughs> uh, for some years I've been trying to get RSV renamed. I think it's a terrible name for a, for a virus, respiratory syncytial virus. No taxi driver could ever remember this. Um, I think SARS is a fantastic name, but RSV is a terrible name. I've been trying to get it named, <coughs> renamed um, the Savage Agent because the group that originally described it was led by Dr. Savage, um, but that hasn't caught on. So here's my new attempt, RSV, the hidden paw. So this is from T.S. Eliot, um, the old possum's book of practical cats. So McCavity is a mystery cat. He's called the hidden paw, for he's the master criminal who can defy the law. He's the battlement of Scotland Yard, the flying squad's despair for when they reach the scene of crime. The cavity's not there. <laughs> yeah. so, that's all right. <laughs> okay, so this was, um, this was, <laughs> so this was um, <coughs> to sum up what we thought we knew um, <coughs> when we were writing reviews maybe two or three years ago about the effects of, um, of enhanced immunity on immunopathology and on the other hand, immune tolerance or um, of infection which allowed the, the virus to overgrow. So you know, either too much virus or too much immunity, we thought that was really the explanation for severe disease. And I just want to now tell you about a study that Ryan Thwaites has been doing, a really amazingly um, accomplished postdoc who's only just finished his PhD and come to us. But within one season, he was able to sample 55 infants with bronchiolitis using this novel technique developed by Trevor Hansel. That's Trevor Hansel's nose there. Um, you put this absorbative strip up the nose and very atraumatically gather a sample, which you can use for virus detection and also for measuring antibodies or, or soluble mediators, whate whatever you want, really. So it has the great advantage that it's very well tolerated. And um, <coughs> if you do a nasopharyngeal aspirate or a nasal scrape, quite often the, the subject or the parent won't let you come back. But with this sampling method, we've taken up to 13 samples per patient, um, and it's just very well tolerated. So <coughs> we started this study with the idea that either we were going to find an excess of virus or we were going to find an excess inflammatory response in those with the most severe disease. So here are the ones with very severe disease who are on ventilators are in red. The milder ones who get out of hospital earlier um, are just on the wards and then they're discharged. So you can see the RSV copy number is actually greater in the more mild of these hospitalized cases, um, as it are a number of mediators like um, CXCL10, um, interferon gamma, uh, RANTI. So in each case, there's, um, there's Actually, the milder disease has higher levels of all these things that we, we thought might explain severity. Um, we did al also do <coughs> some um, RNA extraction and some limited genetic analysis on the, um, on the sorry, tr of analysis of the transcript. And the only thing that we could find that was actually increased in those with greater severity was a signal for IL-17 and MUC5 um, AC. So those seem to be increased, but most of the things we measured would indicate to us that actually there's, an, there's a relative immunoparesis in these babies with very severe disease, but that they don't get um, increased levels of, of virus. And that just, you can't really see it there, but that's the R17A and the MUC5AC. So I think despite having worked pretty exclusively on RSV since 1985, I'm still being surprised and having to change my view about the pathogenesis, which is now summed up on this new graphic, um, <coughs> which shows that there's, with this very, um, w when you s get really severe disease, um <coughs> then there's actually a decline both in mediators and also in, in viral load. Um, and this, that's Ryan Thwaites and Trevor Hansel and his 
on his strips, but these are ambitious team efforts, getting all these samples and analyzing them. Okay, so now I want to go on to experimental infection, which is a thing which I've become much more interested in, in over the past few years. Um, having spent many years trying to work out the pathogenesis in mice, I've now <coughs> returned to doing human studies, which I did initially before I discovered the mouse as a wonderful tool for dissecting immunology. Um, so the number of studies using um, volunteers, deliberate infection studies, has been increasing over the past few years. And we've set up this network called HICVAC, which is Human Infection Challenge um, to Accelerate Vaccine Development. And it's funded by the Medical Research Council. Um, it uses some money which was originally designated for, um, for the um, for overseas aid budget. And so the focus of this is to try to improve uh, vaccine development for lower middle income country settings. So all the <coughs> infections that we work on are common in LMICs. Um, so Andy Pollard is the, um, is the deputy director of this, um, of this consortium, which, which has got a, a number on the management board. And these are the sorts of infection that we're focused on. So quite a few are doing infections with influenza in various ways, but it's not only respiratory, it's also, um, it's also promoting challenge studies using enteric infections and other, other things. Um, it's fairly widely distributed both in the UK and also elsewhere. So we've got a, um, quite a, a lot of sites elsewhere where people have joined the network and we've actually, at the moment, got over 200 people who've signed up to our network and who are eligible to receive funds. So really the purpose of this is to encourage people to, um, to um, do human infection challenge. So this is Max Habibi, one of my former PhD students who is pretending to inoculate one of the other PhD students with, um, with RSV. So initially we were infecting um, adult volunteers up to the age of 55. Our ethics committee has now given us permission to go up to 75. Um, and we're using this Memphis strain, which is the same strain that's been used at H. Vivo. Um, we don't keep them in such close isolation as they do at H. Vivo. And being at doing these studies in a university setting allows us to do very intensive um, sampling, including up to three bronchoscopies. So some of our volunteers are willing to have a bronchoscopy prior to inoculation another one at the peak of the cold, and a third one in convalescence. So we get a lot of samples out of these, out of these victims. Um, <coughs> so this is a typical design where we have nasal curatage, which we can um, use to look at um, RNA expression levels in the mucosa using RNA-seq. A lot of intensive sampling for 10 days whilst they're kept in the facility um, and then they come back um, for follow-up. And the typical pattern with RSV is that we can detect it on uh, maybe 12 hours after inoculation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to go on to get actual infection. It's just some of the virus which is present in the nose. Then we have um, this, this stage for a couple of days when we can't really find virus much um, and nothing appears to be happening. And then the, <coughs> the viral load escalates and reaches a peak at the same time of symptoms at about day seven, and then the symptoms and the viral load decline. So we've got this sort of eclipse phase when the vi virus and the mucosa are negotiating with each other to see which comes out on top. We're also doing influenza challenge, and I put up this slide just to show the contrast between um, the time course with influenza where the symptoms climb fairly rapidly um, and with RSV, where we have this sort of eclipse phase and then a, a more gradual climb. So the virus load with the flu challenge volunteers peaks earlier and then declines, whereas with RSV, it's got a more interesting and complex pattern. Okay, so just to emphasize that <coughs> with, the, um, with the influenza challenge, we had to screen something like 1,400 people in order to find... 24 who are eligible and seronegative because we can't infect people who are seropositive. Whereas 
with RSV, we don't screen at all. We just take all comers because the antibody is so poorly predictive of whether the virus will take or not. Okay, so this is the outcome in 61 adult volunteers. Um, and 44% had no infection. 56% developed an infection of which one third had no symptoms and two thirds had a common cold. So we've divided them into those who developed a cold and those who didn't develop the cold. And this is the symptom score on, on the axis there. And when we divide them in that way and then um, <coughs> graph the mediators, which we can measure using Trevor Hansel's absorptive strips, this is just a range of mediators, interferon alpha, gamma, IP10, um, IL-15, MIP1 alpha, Rantes, and so on. When we, <coughs> when we graph them, you can see that there's a difference in those who go on to develop symptomatic infection, that's in red, um, compared to those that, um, that resist infection in blue. So looking at the red ones, in this, in this um, occult asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic phase, there's a reduction in a lot of mediators, followed by an outpouring of mediators at the time when they get the cold. If you look at the curves for those that don't have a cold, the, the mucosa mounts a gentle immune response during the, um, during the <coughs> silent phase prior to symptoms and um, then a, a achieves dominance. So the host shows a response, the virus is defeated. If the mediators are suppressed, then the virus succeeds. Um, we've submitted that for publication and we're anxiously awaiting, awaiting the outcome. I have obviously haven't had time to show you all the data, but there's some very interesting findings in, in that manuscript, I think. So I'd just like to emphasize Chris Chu, an infectious disease clinician who has been appointed to um, a, a, a substantive post recently and is absolutely vital to all of these studies. Um, and thank you all very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.